Well, if you're able to at home, I invite you to stand for the reading of the gospel. This is the holy gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. That same day Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea, and great crowds gathered about him, so that he got into a boat and sat down. And the whole crowd stood on the beach, and he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Well, good evening, everybody. My name is Amy, and I'm the executive pastor here at Incarnation. And I want to issue a special welcome to any kids who are worshiping with us. This is probably the chunk of the service that you largely tune out for. Uh, but before you do, we are going to be reading from Isaiah 55 tonight. And right at the start of that chapter is this invitation to this big feast. And I want you to imagine what is like the best feast you could possibly get invited to. Maybe you want to spend this time making a menu for that feast, or maybe you want to make a list of ingredients. Maybe you even want to look up some recipes in your parents' cookbooks. Maybe you want to draw the feast. But that's my invitation to you, and I'm going to chatter on for a little bit longer. Let's pray. Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you. Amen. Well, here we are again, worshiping for our 18th week online. And I have to say, here at week 18, that I am really tired. I'm just so tired. This pandemic, this life at home with my kids, with grad school, with work, and all this unrest in our country, this endless cycle of outrage on social media, all this uncertainty about our future, it's just like it's all piled up in my body, and I'm just exhausted. And the more I talk to so many of you, the more we text and call and walk and check in, the more I hear that from you too, we are all just really, really tired. But I also have a confession to make because for me, like the more tired I get, the more I actually resist rest. The more I start to buy into this delusion that if I can just like work harder and do more, somehow I'm like gonna get on top of this thing. I sort of forget who I am. I forget that I'm just a human being, that I have limits, that God made me to rest in his presence, to depend on him, to come to him when I need to be restored. And I have a very recent example of this because uh, every month I meet with a spiritual director for an hour and we listen to God together. And like 90% of our time is just sitting in silence. And it's 
deeply, deeply refreshing. I always leave feeling so much lighter. And yet when I need this most, like the more overwhelmed and the more burned out I feel, I start to put it off. I start to reschedule our appointments. I kind of ignore her emails for as long as feels appropriate. And that's what I did this month. I put it off. I felt like I just don't have an hour to sit and be silent. But we did finally meet a couple weeks ago. And in like the first five minutes of just being quiet, my whole body eased up. I felt the weight of all my burdens physically lifted. I suddenly noticed that the birds were singing and there was wind in the trees. I noticed how God was taking care of me in like every fiber of his creation. I felt filled up with joy and gratitude in just a couple minutes. And I actually started to laugh because it seemed like God was saying, You've been avoiding me because you didn't have an hour to sit and be quiet. But I didn't need an hour. I just needed a couple minutes. I will take anything you will give me if you will just come. Just come. And today's text that Abby read for us a couple minutes ago is Isaiah 55. And it's this beautiful invitation to just come. Just come. God invites us to come to him exactly where we are right now, no matter how burned out or overwhelmed, ashamed or scared or mad or sad or whatever. We just need to drag ourselves into his presence and be restored. And we're actually going to spend the next two weeks in this passage because I think it has so much to say to us. But first, we need some background. So in chapter 55, the prophet Isaiah is talking to people who are in exile a long, long, long time ago, long before Isaiah was born, God had made this covenant with the Jewish people. He had promised to be their God, and he had invited them to live in this fresh new way that was totally different from the way everyone around them lived, a way of justice and mercy. It was a way of rest and dependence and trust. But living this way was hard, and his people failed again and again and again. So for about 100 years before Isaiah is talking, God sent his people these prophets to warn them, to say, you've broken your end of the promise with God, and if you don't change your ways, he's going to have to do like a big disruption to set things right. But that was hard too, and they failed again and again, and they didn't change. And so finally that big disruption did come. It came in the form of the Babylonian army marching into their city, destroying their homes, destroying their holy temple, and then carting them off across the wilderness to live as exiles in this foreign land. But Interestingly, the Jewish people actually did pretty well as exiles in Babylon. Now, the Babylonian Empire was not built on justice and mercy and rest and all of those good things that God had made for them. It was built on greed and violence and oppression and striving. But they got into it. They hustled. They invested they kind of made a life for themselves in the economics and the politics of Babylon. But as they did, they forgot who they were. They forgot how they were really made to live. Not by hustle, not by anxiety, but by rest and trust in the God who had ordered the world. So they were like those seeds that I read about earlier in that parable the seeds that fall on bad soil, that don't have roots, they get choked out, they get scorched, they get scattered, they just kind of disappear into the soil of this empire. They never bring any kind of harvest. And that temptation is so real for us too. Obviously, we are not Jewish captives in Babylon, but we do experience exile. We experience that sense of being far from our real home, 
far from God, forgetting who we really are, forgetting how we were made to live. In a small way, this pandemic has been a kind of exile because we're cut off from the sort of human touch and meaningful work and tangible in-person worship that makes life meaningful. It feels like we're out here in this Zoom wilderness, in this land of confusion and turmoil and fear. And then beyond that, if we have trusted Jesus, if we are trying to follow him with our lives, then this life is like an exile for us because we've been brought into this kingdom of God. We've been invited to live in this fresh new way, in the way of Jesus, a way that's so different from the world around us, this way of radical love for God, love for our neighbors, even love for our enemies. But that's not the way of our world. Our world is a lot more like Babylon. And we get tempted, too, to participate in the systems of this world, in the hustle and the anxiety, in the distraction and the cheap comforts, in greed and politics, in this toxic 24-hour news cycle. And after a while, we can forget who we really are and how we were made to live. So in chapter 55, the prophet Isaiah is calling the exiles home. He's calling to the Jewish people in Babylon, and he's calling to you and to me. And he says this, Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come, buy, and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Listen diligently to me and eat what is good. Delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? It's this incredible invitation. Stop performing. Stop striving. Stop fending for yourself and just come home. Just as you are, come empty-handed, desperate, sinful, needy. Come and feast and rest and live. It sounds almost too good to be true. But then in verses 4 through 9, God explains that it's not. Because he's going to do everything he has to do to restore his people. He's going to make a new covenant with them. He's going to send a new leader He's going to draw near to them with his boundless compassion. God's table is set. His door is open. He is ready to welcome the exiles home to feast. Listen to verses 6 and 7. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. And that abundant pardon of God is wide open to us. It's wide open to everybody. Because 600 years after Isaiah said all that, God came near once and for all in the person of Jesus. And he took on all those generations of human failure, all those broken covenants, all of that corrupt and empty exile living. He took it on himself, on the cross, so that we can come and feast at his table as forgiven people. So are you tired of this exile life? Are you burned out and exhausted by this pandemic? Are you ready to stop distracting yourself with things that don't satisfy? Do you need the nourishment that God is giving at his table? Well, I think we all do. I know that I do. So let's accept his invitation and come. But how do we do that, practically? We need to actually make time and space for the presence of God. This is like pulling out those rocks and thorns from the parable. 
we actually have to clear out a little patch of soil in our lives where seeds can grow. A little patch of quiet, undistracted time with God. The theologian Dallas Willard has, Willard has said, if you don't come apart for a while, you will come apart after a while. And so this week, I want you to come apart with God for a while. Like I said at the beginning, God will work with whatever you can bring. Obviously, five minutes is not like optimal for a sustained life with God. But if you don't have more, start with five minutes. This week, I want you to commit to at least five minutes of intentional rest in God's presence. Clear your calendar, clear your distractions, turn off your phone, turn off all your screens, set down your cares. Don't try to achieve anything. You might need to go for a walk. You might need to lay down on your pillow. But however and wherever you can, come empty-handed and let God nourish you.